So I'm already a bit older than most of you, so that means I grew up in a world where I was the only kid in my town who liked computers and Star Trek and like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and weird shit. And being here with all of you is just like having friends. So I really appreciate all of you for being here. Um, so my name is Jos. Uh, I got, uh, I'm a software engineer at a, uh, some scale up in Silicon Valley and I have a law degree. Uh, and so this is me in my lawyer's robes, and I'm going to talk about predictive policing, specifically predictive policing in the Netherlands. And so we're going to talk about what is predictive policing, how do these systems work, I have some examples of predictive policing systems that are deployed in the Netherlands or were deployed in the Netherlands. Specifically, I'm going to talk about the legal status of suspicions generated by a computer. And the question there is, if a police officer walks up to you and goes like, I have this printout here, and it says that you're probably up to something no good, can they arrest you for that? And so this has never been tested in court, but I'm going to predict this for you. And so in a few years, you will see that I'm right. That bit includes audience participation. Now, in order to participate in the audience participation, you need to be able to raise your right hand. So all of you, please raise your right hand now. OK, most of you are able to do the audience participation bit. Thank you very much. So, introducing predictive policing. What is predictive policing? Predictive policing is generating predictions about crime with a computer. But that's it, basically. This can be crime committed by persons, or a crime that will victimize particular persons, or it can be places where particular crimes are going to happen. This is a... Uh, the, 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 the term predictive policing was coined by Bill Bratton, who is an outstanding police officer who was the chief of the Boston police force, the LA police force, and the New York police force. So this is a guy who knows something about policing. The term was uh, it, used, it doesn't really apply to a particular algorithm. So I am not gonna bore you with the question, is this artificial intelligence? Is this big data? Is this machine learning? Is this risk profiling? I don't particularly care if it's a system that uses data and a computer to generate a prediction. I call it predictive policing because most of these terms mean different things to different people. They're not very interesting. What is big data for a police officer might fit on like sort of the spare spaces between the memory buffers of my screen somewhere. Um, artificial intelligence seems to be a term that is only used for things that uh, only humans could do until recently, uh, but now a computer can do it as a time when playing a, a game of chess was artificial intelligence, and now this is no longer true. So this, this is not particularly interesting. I'm going really fast. Are you still with me? Awesome. Thank you. So we have been predicting crime since the dawn of time, because you know, since the dawn of time, there was crime, and so people have been trying to predict that. And even before we had computers, we had people that were trying to predict crime, and they're called crime analysts. And every police force has crime analysts. And these crime analysts, they use crystal balls, calculators, uh, an abacus. This, is, this room is called abacus. That's why I had to say abacus, uh, to generate predictions about crime. So we've been doing this like since the cows came home. But then happened, then computers came. And uh, so computers came and people thought, oh, what are they going to do with that? The answer was play Pong. Uh, but then Bill Bratton uh, ran a program called CompStat. Who here has heard about CompStat? Few people. Anyone here? Did you see The Wire? Yeah, OK, The Wire, CompStat. Okay. CompStat was a program in the US police force where they looked at data and tried to steer the use of police resources people, cars, horses, dogs, pepper spray, to optimize uh, clearance rates. And clearance rates is like just crimes being solved. And so these people had like weekly meetings and they were like hit over the head with a police baton if the clearance rates went down. And so they're like, oh my fucking God, the clearance rates need to go up. 
How do I make the clearance rates go up? Answer is easy, stop recording crimes. Because if you stop recording crimes, you have fewer crimes, and then, or you only record the crimes when you have solved them. Because then the clearance rate, the clearance rate and the crime rate go hand in hand. Uh, I can really recommend that practice if clearance rates is the only thing that you uh, are interested in. Bill Bratton thought, like, we have computers, we can use these same stats and Excel and generate predictions about crime. And this is what happens. Basically, I'll get to that later, how that worked. But modern technology added, and I'm not going to talk about machine learning a lot, because all of you know how machine learning works, and all of you know how TensorFlow works, and all of you can at least do sort of logistic regression on your HP calculators. Computers added the fact that quantity has its own quality. So if you have lots of data, and you have lots of processing powers, you can go to a level of finding patterns in that data that are impossible to do if you're just a human. Humans are not very good at finding accurate patterns in large unstructured sets of data. And so I got this quote here that says, humans can sometimes find a needle in a haystack. Modern technology can search all the haystacks, figure out what's normal in a haystack, find all the things that deviate from that norm, which might be needles. Any guess who said that? You. Yeah, I said that, so thank you very much. <laughs> it was in my master thesis on this very topic, and because my master thesis was evaluated by law professors, and law professors and computers uh, don't mix very well. This has become so standard that you can buy this book, which is called Data Mining and Predictive Analysis, and if you want to have like a little shrill moment, we go like, this is scary, you need to go to Amazon, then you have that shrill moment, but then you need to continue and read the description of this book, and then you get your second shrill moment, because this book describes how you can use off-the-shelf tools, like Excel, to, find, to predict crime. So the author basically says, here's a shit ton of math, here's a bunch of Excel macros, Export the CSV file from your local crime reporting system if you're down in Hackensack uh, Police Department, and you can use this, and now you can predict some crime. And police officers do this. This is extremely scary because these people don't necessarily know what they're doing when using computers or not using computers. Um, okay, are you still with me? Yes. Okay, you're still with me. Uh, 10 minutes in, this is going well. So, how do these predictive police systems work? They work like this. This is a diagram that I copied from my research report on the topic, and it basically says you have some data, you run some math, now you have a prediction, and you give that prediction to a police officer, and you go like, here's a prediction about some crime, go do something with that. And then they find crime, and they have new data, and they run the next generation of the model, and then they have some new report. And this is literally how this goes. So that, that you can see the feedback loop here, where actual data turns into historical data, and turns into the next generation of the model. And this is one of the problems with predictive policing. And I'll get to that later, but I'll announce this now quickly. All of us, as we are sitting here, are uh, committing some crimes. And the reason for that is that the, the stack of law books is about this high, and there is no way that any of us are in complete compliance with everything that's in there. The only reason that you're not arrested right now is that you have not annoyed enough of the right people to be arrested, and there's just not enough police around here in uniform. If, this is a tip for people. If you want to discover undercover police officers in the Netherlands, Look at their shoes, because they're all wearing black Mephistos with shoelaces. So if you see any of these people, they're undercover police officers. So you haven't an, uh, annoyed enough of the right people yet, that is why you're not getting arrested, because you're all doing something wrong. Now, this means that if you use predictive policing to send a bunch of police officers to a place, they will find crime there, because there's crime everywhere. 
And then they find that crime that goes back into the model and go like, oh my God, this is a place where there's a lot of crime. Let's send some more police officers to there. So they go back to that same place and find more crime. And this is the feedback loop that a lot of predictive policing systems are vulnerable to. I'm not saying that this is happening all the time, but they're vulnerable to it. Um, let me see, did I have my speakers now say? Oh, no, I got it all. Um, so let's talk about some predictive policing systems. Uh, I, I name four, I'll cover three very briefly. There is information on the internet about what all of these uh, systems do in somewhat more detail. So here are some predictive police uh, systems. First of all, uh, Pratpol. Uh, from the US, also applied in the United Kingdom. Uh, the strategic subjects list, which is one of my favorites, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But like, if you want to know more about it, talk to me today or tomorrow, because it's fascinating shit. Um, the crime anticipation system, or as you say in Holland, het criminaliteitsanticipatiesysteem. Leuk woord voor galgje, of voor scrabble, 48 punten. Um, and sensing, which is also in the Netherlands. Any of you have a favorite system that's not on the list? No, okay. Sorry? Free crime. Oh, pre crime. Oh, yeah, yeah, minority report. Yeah. I was, I was like this close to call my master thesis minority report on the A, because the A is the river that goes through Amsterdam. But I couldn't get the introduction running. It's kind of weird. And uh, so, if you, who has seen the movie Minority Report? So, who has read the short story? Okay, it's fewer people. Okay, all of you who have seen the movie, go read the short story. Like any of, Stanley, of, uh, uh, like any of his work, what's the author again? Philip K. Dick. Uh, uh, sorry? Philip K. Oh yeah, Philip K. Dick. Like any of, thank you very much, any of Philip K. Dick's work, the stories are infinitely better than the movie, and all of Philip K. Dick's work, you have to answer the following three questions. Or no, actually, no, you have to answer one question. The question is, who here is on LSD? Is it the reader, the protagonist in the story, or the author? Potentially more than one. <laughs> I, <laughs> that it's, and so Minority Report's stunning. It's a, it's a decent movie, if you like uh, Tom Cruise. It's a, a stunning short story, and it's about predictive policing using mutants. The police in Holland does not have telepathic for uh, uh, mutants with foresight, but they have computers. However, before we get there, are you still with me? Yes. yes. Okay. Are we enjoying this? Yes. Thank you. Um, first, uh, first software, Pretpol, uh, or as they name it now, Geolitica. Um, so this was based on the insight that I mentioned before, which is that the data that you get for CompStat can be used to make crime predictions. And so they put some scientists on it, they did light wet, uh, white lab coats from UCLA and uh, Santa Clara, and they developed an algorithm, and that algorithm is called ETAS, and that is patented in uh, patent law. You can read it, it's like any patent, it's a completely useless, it doesn't say anything about anything. Uh, and there's a commercial implementation by Pretpol Inc., which is now renamed, and they sell this through the United States. Um, and because it is a company, it is secret how it works. We, we don't really... Personally, I think that's a problem. But I'm... So I, I, I have to say, I work and live in the United States, um, and I'm the, I'm the odd one out there. So we're in Holland. For those of you who follow Dutch politics, I'm like on the right side of T66, which makes me sort of like a suspicious right-wing character here in Holland. In America, I'm like a fucking communist. People come to me and go like, Yas, you don't understand, Bernie is a socialist. And like, no, 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 Bernie is a millionaire. Socialism is the common ownership of the means of production. And, and then I've lost them. I've said he, um, anyway, so I think that is problematic. Uh, but as we will see, other systems aren't much better. So what are the foundations of the ETAS algorithm? The foundations of the ETAS algorithms are three. One of them is called repeat victimization, which basically means if you are a victim of a certain type of crime, you are more likely 
than most to become a victim of exactly that same type of crime again. <laughs> Secondly, near repeat victimization. People that are near you, if your house gets burgled, the houses around you have a higher probability of being burgled within a short amount of time. Because burglars work street by street. Maybe work street by street, or they take the same bus into the suburbs, rob a bunch of houses, the next day they take the same bus into the suburbs, they break into a bunch of houses. This is one of the reasons why we don't have public transport in the United States, because peop I am not fucking kidding you, People do not want subway lines or buses into their neighborhoods because that will bring criminals from, in case of Boston, downtown crossing, which is like right downtown where like three major subway lines meet. Um, and local search. And local search is the most amazing insight of this, is that criminals are very likely, or no, are more likely than average to commit crimes near what we call the anchors of their existence. So their home, their work, and on the route between them. Personally, I think if I would be a burglar, I would not burgle the homes where I live, because that makes it much more likely that I get recognized. But apparently, burglars do this. Now, this is not crazy shit. There is actual science that sort of bears these statements out. So there's criminologists. Are there any criminologists in the audience? No, no criminal. So criminologists, they study a crime as a social science. They've been writing papers about this for a long time. And so this basically, this bears out. This is, this is true for the, to the extent that you can say that things in, are actually true. So they developed the ETAS algorithm, epidemic type aftershock sequence. And the principle is, okay, there's like a chance of crime. And because of these three patterns, there's sort of an aftershock, like an earthquake. And that aftershock dampens over time. And then they have this formula that comes from the Pratpool website. They don't say what any of these variables means. So it's called, uh, it's called proof by intimidation. Like, uh, intimidation math, like, oh my god, he's got math. This shit must be good. Like, so, um, and this is what they do. So, uh, what I would love to discuss, but I have no time for, the field experiments they did that showed that there's all sorts of like problematic uh, reasons, and Pratt Paul's amazing statement that their system is free of prejudice. Okay, that was Pratt Paul. System number two, sensing. Sensing was a project by the Dutch police of Roermond, which is in the south of the Netherlands. Uh, Roermond has a big shopping mall, and they had figured out that criminals come there to pickpocket and rob and break into cars. It's called mobile banditism, mobile banditism. And they go like, what we're gonna do, we're gonna develop a predictive policing system that will just tell us who these people are. And then we're gonna deal with them before they get to the mall. This system, which has many problematic aspects, was paused in 2020, because what happened in 2020? There was a sharp decline of people coming to the mall. One of the great advantages of the pandemic, that this system was killed. So how did census work? We don't know. It is secret. There was a Freedom of Information Act uh, request for Dutch, the VOB, or as you call it now, the VOO, the Wet Open Overheid. And they figured out that it's probably related to the following things. There's a group of men in a car with a German or Romanian license plate rental car three to five years old, or a car that's stolen, that's probably hugely important. And then it goes into the secret, these and other factors go into the secret algorithm, projects a risk score, if that score exceeds a threshold, it goes to some police officers on the street, or like on the freeway in this case, and they go and stop that car. Now the question is, based on what legal theory? And I'm going to explain to that, so that's, stay tuned, but that's what they do. The Freedom of Information Act gave us the following information. You see, you see there's a little N here that was not secret. <laughs> so the letter N <laughs> has got something to do with this. Uh, I mean, some of the shit that they blocked out is amazing. This says the administration of the reference lists is taking place at... Locked out. 
some office, secret office, or the responsible department for the downloading and updating of the reference file, we can't notice. The fabric of society would unravel when we notice it. <laughs> Third one up, the crime anticipation system, that criminaliteits anticipatie system, developed by the police unit of Amsterdam, currently being rolled out and implemented in the entire country. The goal was to create enriched forecasts of crime and turning these into tangible instructions and then ensure that beat police officers act according to these instructions. This came right out of the Dilbert mission statement <laughs> generator. There's an amazing video on YouTube, uh, Crime Cost for Kids, and explains sort of like in two kids, like, you know, this is your computer and <laughs> amazing video. Um, how does it work? Pretty much the same as ETAS. So it has a focus on burglary and street robberies. It um, takes data from all sorts of sources. It generates heat maps on where the crime is going to happen in squares of 125 by 125 meters. And then the 3% of squares with the highest risk scores are colored yellow, orange, and red. And then you get something like this. This is uh, Amsterdam. Apparently, a lot of crime in the east of Amsterdam. Without the computer, we would have never guessed this. Completely novel insight. Strangely enough, not on the map, but there's something here in the south of Amsterdam called the Southern Axis, where all the big law firms are, not colored red, but I'm pretty certain that there's a shit ton of crime <laughs> happening right there. But that is not the crime that they're interested in. These systems exist. I will keep my social commentary to myself. Um, some issues around predictive policing. Now, this is a very suave audience that knows about computers, so I'm going to like run through them because it's completely obvious. Um, first of all, input data quality. Crime reporting is incredibly hard, and criminal data about which crimes happened and where they happened is completely unevenly distributed based on social economic factors, type of crime, who is liable to report his crime, like, there's a whole, it's, it's, it's a morass. So, a big thing in criminology, which is the study of crime as a social science, is guessing the dark number, the unreported crime. Uh, I've never heard any discussion about this in any of my predictive policing research that I've done. Police seems to be unaware of this. Um, secondly, uh, this is the only thing I'm going to say about that, but apparently, there is some racial prejudice in society, and apparently, computers leverage and amplify that racial prejudice. The police seem to be completely unaware of this, never read anything about any of this in any of the research that I've done, including reports by the police itself. Personally, I think this is a problem. But again, what am I? I'm white in America, and so who am I going to complain to? Um, so the, the social justice impact is amazing. These systems get used to predict low-level street crime. Bernie Madoff was not caught by a predictive policing system. Like, uh, no, for, it's always pickpocketing, street like, like burglaries, robberies, etc. And I already mentioned the feedback loop. Most importantly, does it work? And the answer is, we don't know whether it works. What I do know is that a few teams in America discontinued the use of Pretpol because either it was too expensive or they just couldn't figure out what to do with the predictions. So he says, does it work? Yes, the predictive aspects somewhat work, but I think that they're also obvious. Right? Does it lead to more solved crimes? I have not seen any definitive data about that. There are some reports that say that it works, but they're mostly done by people that are sort of not unbiased with respect to the police, predictive policing system that they're using. Does it then at least lead to the same clearance crimes with fewer cops? Even that, I don't know. Personally, I don't think it works. Right? But, okay. So, that's that. Now we get to the legal aspects of predictive policing. Uh, let me take a short break here to ask you, are you still with me? 
Okay, cool. Hang on. I love giving talks to a hyper-intelligent audience. The hardest course I have ever taught was Java for non-programmers. It's a bit of a hard course, because someone asked me when I had explained the if statement, but why do you need an if statement? So I thought about it for a while, and I told her, like, well, imagine a world with an if statement, and imagine a world without an if statement. That in itself is an if statement. I had a lot of fun there. Yeah. No, it was. People were super nice. Um, OK, legal aspects. Now, this is uh, Meester Jos Visser talking, your friendly neighborhood lawyer. In the Netherlands, you can only, the police can only use certain invasive investigative measures when there's a reasonable, reasonable suspicion of guilt based on facts and circumstances that a crime was committed and that the target of the, the, the suspect is guilty of it. For the Dutch people among us, Artikel 27, strafvordering. Als verdachte wordt voordat de vervolging is aangevangen, aangemerkt degene ten wiens aanzien uit feiten of omstandigheden een redelijk vermoeden van schuld aan een strafbaar feit voortvloeit. Um, now, in America we have the Fourth Amendment, which is a reasonable uh, stop and search, uh, search and seizure. Volumes bookshelves, libraries full of legal analysis about the Fourth Amendment. In Holland, the entire sort of like jurisprudence and legal analysis on Article 27 is about this thick, 12-pitch, single-sided US letter. I know because I printed it out. Um, and I'll explain to you why. So you have to have reasonable guilt of suspicion, crime, etc. Now, we have to, uh, so all of you, everything you've ever seen on television about this is false. Even if you've watched a US television show and you think you know something about the Fourth Amendment, it is also false. TV, my friends, is not a documentary on the US legal system. Uh, with the possible exception of We Own This City by, uh, on HBO Max, which is totally amazing. Um, so even in the US, the Fourth Amendment doesn't work the way uh, you think it might work. Read these two statements, uh, or read these, these two court cases, because the, the US Supreme Court has been executing a low-level war on the uh, Fourth Amendment since 1984. Um, ask me about this after the fact. I got amazing um, uh, case law um, about this. So forget everything you've learned on TV. So now it is time for audience participation by a raise of hands. So this is the case. The police officer gets a, a call from the office that has a, a burglary in a school, and then uh, he walks around and he sees someone he knows professionally um, walking from the direction of the school wearing black gloves. He goes like, that, that's not kosher. Stops this person and arrests them uh, on suspicion of having committed that burglary. Was this reasonable? If you think this is reasonable suspicion of guilt, raise your hand. Okay, none of you should ever talk to a police officer ever. This is reasonable suspicion of guilt in the Netherlands. Famous case, exactly this case. Look for Zwarte Handschoenen in Braak, and you'll get the case. This is reasonable suspicion of guilt. Next one. Sorry? No, if you just look for Zwarte Handschoenen in Braak School, then, then you can find it. But it's, it's, exact, it's exactly what happened. If you read this, you got the summary of the case. Apart from the fact that the judge says, like, no, this is totally reasonable. Um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what I think of this, I must honestly say. I'm not sure. Uh, we don't, who knows if we don't care? Oh, the, oh sorry. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. You're absolutely right. The question from the audience was, was this person convicted? I don't know and I don't care. Because, come again? Uh, no, uh, arresteren. Uh, the question is, is it staande houden or arresteren? <laughs> I mean, Dutch man, it's not a language, it's more like a heap of words that starts with... Yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> geweldig. Uh, 
my wife is American. After like many years of marriage, I got her to say van harte gefeliciteerd on my birthday. I think this is a... Lisa, honey, if you watch this on the stream or on video, I love you. I, I do. She's, she's a remarkable piece of work. Uh, and people who know me better go like, dude, that's what you need, really. Um, so the question was, was it legal to s just stop them or arrest them? And I, I can't quite remember, and it doesn't matter. I need to go on. Oh. Second case. Two police officers see a black man running away from a cafe that they know is a place where drugs are being sold. They think this is suspicious. Black man running away from a known drugs den. They stop him, they find some heroin. Even in the Netherlands, when this was, case happened in the 70s, they thought this was not cool. Uh, so they arrested him. Regarding the stop of search, is this reasonable suspicion of guilt or not? Who thinks this is reasonable suspicion of guilt? No? Uh, you're wrong. The court said it was not reasonable suspicion of guilt. Black men running in the Netherlands, completely legal. I mean, we are, we are worldwide known for our tolerance, and this shows it. Actually, people think the Holland is tolerant. We're not. We don't generally give a fuck. It's not tolerance. It's just like, I, fuck, I don't care. Okay. Audience participation, number three. Police officers, again, see a white man talking to a few black men. Sometime later, they see the group driving around in a car with a German license plate. This is why I only in Deutsch angefangen habe. Die Deutsche sind sehr wichtig für die holländische jurisprudence. Um, the next thing that happens is they see that car parked in the street. They go like, this is bad. Like, white black men in the same car, German license plate. This is crazy shit. So they, they cross the road to go to that car, and the black men run away. And we know that that's legal. Black... <laughs> Black men can run away. Uh, but they go like, yeah, this is crazy. They, they search the white men, find drugs. Regarding the stop and search of the white men, is it reasonable suspicion of guilt or not? Who thinks it's reasonable suspicion of guilt? Yeah? OK, so the people raised their hand are right. This is reasonable suspicion of guilt. And now, so this case is called Damrak, which is a street in Amsterdam. It's where it happened. And the last case is called it used to be called differently, but I now like to refer it as to the, the running colored gentleman. Um, but that is not the, the, the traditional name of the case. Don't ask me what it was. Um, no, I can't say what it was. Uh, the, uh, uh, sorry? Uh, your words, not mine. So it's a, uh, go, go talk to this. What's your name, lady? What's your name? Okay, go talk to Inge. And she has, uh, she can say whatever she wants, because <laughs> free country, man. Yeah, so you can ask, uh, what is the difference between this case and the last case? We don't quite know. But what happened in this particular case, and it's very important, is that the police officer who did the stop and search said, like, well, in my vast experience as a police officer in Amsterdam, if I see foreign white men talking to black men, that's a drugs deal. And the judge goes like, that's completely reasonable. <laughs> and so this is reasonable suspicion of guilt. Audience participation number four, and the last one, I promise. Two police officers see a person they know professionally walk around with a plastic bag. Hmm. So they talk to the person and go like, hey, what's in the bag? And the guy says like, oh, some books I've just stolen. <laughs> Criminals are not necessarily smart. <laughs> and so they arrest this person on suspicion of theft of books. Regarding the stop and the ensuing conversation, is that a reasonable suspicion of guilt or not? Says yes, no. Who says yes? Okay, uh, okay, who says no? Okay. You're all wrong. <laughs> and I will explain to you why you're all wrong. The judge didn't get to the question whether it was, and uh, this requires some fine legal training, didn't get to the question whether there's a reasonable suspicion of guilt or not, because the police, just like any other citizen, can have a conversation with someone and just ask, hey, how are you doing? What's in the bag? 
that is not an execution of investigative powers by the police. It doesn't require special permission to do this. Anyone can do this. If you now confess to having committed a crime, now they have reasonable suspicion, and they, uh, they arrest you. And so there was, they didn't need reasonable suspicion of guilt to talk to the person, because anyone can do that. And after they, the guy had basically confessed that he committed a crime, now they could arrest him, and it was completely reasonable. Everyone still with me? Okay. So, this goes to something called the continued application of powers. And this is important. Remember this phrase, voortgezette toepassing van bevoegdheden. I cut this piece from the actual case, put it in Google Translate, and this is what came out of it. Which is amazing. I've worked for Google for 12 years. I think an amazing company, uh, if for no other reason that I can do this. Um, what happens, so the police has powers under different laws. Some of these are criminal laws. Some of them are administrative laws. So the police, as the administrative executors of the Liquor Act, can come into your cafe and check your permit. While they are there, legally, as the administrative officers of the Liquor Act, they see a gun, and they go, like, hey, this is a gun, this is illegal. Now they can continue to use powers that they get from another law, criminal law, because now they have reasonable suspicion. This is super important. This is what happened in the last case about the books in the plastic bag. This has happened in what? In the, the, the Geweer arrest, the rifle case. And this is what happens in sensing. Because what happened is, remember sensing, hormone, mobile banditism, cars? What police would do is they would get the risk score, and then they would go and stop the car under their powers in the Road Traffic Safety Act. And according to the Road Traffic Safety Act, the police can stop any car, inspect your driver's license and registration, like, and, that's, and they don't need any reasonable suspicion. They can just do that, like whatever. And then while they do that, they're going to, huh, this kind of suspicious. These people are smoking dope. I don't like this car. It's a bit of a mess. They don't have a real story about where they are or where they're going. I'm going to frisk, arrest, search, like whatever the investigative powers are. And this is continued application of powers. They stop the car under their powers in the Road Traffic and Safety Act, Wege Verkeerswet, and then they can, once they then get like a reasonable suspicion, they continue to use the powers from the criminal law, and that is how they sort of get around that. Now, you would ask yourself, I would ask myself, is this legal? And the answer is no. It's called détournement de pouvoir. It's like a rerouting of powers. You can only use an administrative power for the explicit purpose that it is given for. If you get powers out of the Road and Safety Act, you can only use this to improve road safety. You cannot use this as a cover for something else altogether, which is like mobile banditism. So it's not allowed. Does it happen? Yes, all the time. Like, why is this not stopped? It doesn't get to court, these cases. The court, it's untested. Like, and also, when in court, the police lies. Like, I don't hope the police, one of my nieces works for the police, but please lie. They go to court, they go like, no, no, we, we just, we really just, you know, car looked a bit flimsy, wanted to check the insurance, you never know. And then, completely unexpectedly, 10 minutes, we found this. Uh, so, they do this. I think this is problematic. So why does this not get tested in court? Two reasons. Reason number one, these cases only come to court for guilty people. Because innocent people, they get like, because they're materially innocent, they get sent packing and they go like, fucking happy, I'm done with this shit, and they're not gonna go and press the legal matter. Guilty people go like, I'm guilty as fuck, but maybe I can get a way out. And then the court goes like, yeah, this is one of these things that guilty people do to escape punishment. That's really not right. And so the, the Dutch version of the district attorney, the prosecuting uh, officer, and the judges are just not often willing to cut people a break. And this is also related to a fundamental difference in the Dutch and American system of criminal prudence and uh, jurisprudence. It's like uh, the inquisitorial versus the accusatorial system. The, the, the goal of the Dutch system 
is to find the truth. And formalism shouldn't get in the way of that too much, even when the police and the district attorney at Open by Ministerie are like way out of line, the judge is very, very restricted in like putting a stop to this. So that's part one. Part number two, your reasonable suspicion of guilt needs to be based on facts and circumstances. Uh, just a feeling is not enough. However, the list of facts and circumstances that can lead to a reasonable suspicion is very long and very inclusive. One of the few times when the Dutch police is very inclusive so when it comes to facts and circumstances. This stuff is only tested marginally in courts. And by marginal testing, I mean that the judge asks himself, is it completely unreasonable that the police officer got to this conclusion? And if the answer is no, it's not completely unreasonable, it's reasonable and it's allowed. So, grounds for reasonable suspicion. Caught in the act, the normal situation. I, as a police officer, see something that's not normal here. Knowledge and experience. I know that if white men and black men talk, it's about drugs. Official notices. Tips from the team criminal intelligence. Anonymous tips are allowed uh, as grounds for reasonable suspicion. Sometimes the court puts some fences around that, but the, the Supreme Court said the general thought that an anonymous tip cannot lead to a reasonable suspicion of guilt is not true. So it's actually easier to say what is unreasonable suspicion of guilt. It's if it's completely based on the intuition, if it's entirely based on prejudice, if the information is clearly unreliable, or the argumentation is just completely flimsy, then it's unreasonable. If it doesn't meet any of these tests, reasonable application, sorry, reasonable uh, suspicion of guilt. So what does this mean for predictive policing? It said it's untested in court, but I am totally pessimistic. And why am I totally pessimistic? I'm totally pessimistic because information from the predictive police system is a source that is based on data about crimes in the past, is not that dissimilar from the knowledge and experience of police officers. It is not that dissimilar from things about the normal situation. It is not that dissimilar to anonymous tips. It is not that dissimilar from the work of crime analysts that put down their work in uh, uh, official notices and send it to the police officers. And we know from existing jurisprudence that all these things are an important factor in determining reasonable suspicion of guilt. So I am very pessimistic that the court will say like, well, this is completely, that comes from a computer, I understand logistic regression, I understand bias amplification, I understand dark numbers, I understand, I think this is unreasonable. I don't think the court's gonna say that. I don't know, but I think the court's not gonna say that. I have some hope, five minutes? Okay. I have some hope that the court will, some court, someday, in Holland, will go and go like, well, I need to understand how this data gets put together. And so that goes to explainability of machine learning models. Now, this is not a talk about machine learning, but like there is, there is some the theoretical research in the area of explainability, and that goes to questions like, how did this machine come to the outcome? Now, certain types of algorithms and machine learning models are explainable. You can sort of figure out how the input data was constructed and the output data arrived, like decision trees and most of the regression models, etc. A whole lot of models these days, the deep learning models, are not explainable. You put a ton of features in it, you have no fucking clue how it got to the outcome. No one knows. Uh, I have some hope that non-explainable models will at least be put to kibosh on, but I, I hope. Hope is not a strategy. The concept of marginal testing doesn't help. Courts are very convinced by experts. If I show up in my other capacity as senior principal engineer, and like, well, uh, judge, this, this, this model is like, uh, is, uh, high quality, it's like established patterns in the space, it is made according to the best practices that we know. The court goes like, well, you know, like, Yas says so, this, this must be true. I, personally, am worried about that, that people would believe me, in general. <laughs> but then people go like, but what about Siri? System risk uh, identification, uh, who was it? Uh, Maxime Febevari, uh, sued the Dutch state about like a system like this. And people who come to me and say, but Siri, like, you're, you're clearly not a lawyer. Siri is administrative law. This is criminal law. Two completely separate domains. Got nothing to do with each other. 
So we hope that some of this wisdom influences the criminal courts, but I'm pessimistic. One of the reasons why I'm pessimistic is that criminal law has a lot of carve-outs. Article 2 of the GDPR says this regulation does not apply to the processing of data by competent authorities for the purposes of prevention, investigation, detection, or prosecution of criminal offenses or the execution of criminal penalties, including the safeguarding against and the prevention of threats to public security. GDPR does not apply to predictive policing systems. GDPR, civil law, completely different domain. Administrative law, completely different domain. Criminal law, to the point that certain legal terms, so for the Dutch amongst that word, goed, has a different meaning in criminal law and in civil law. Just, just, you know, just how it is. So, I am completely not optimistic about any of this. Um, what I am pessimistic about is the police is all in on this technology. They're all in on predictive policing. I see, and I have seen no evidence in law enforcement circles that anyone's even thinking about this, especially not in the Netherlands. In the US, I have found some papers in legal journals where there's some thinking about this. In Holland, I haven't seen any of that. And like, uh, there, was a, there was a pilot with the criminal uh, anticipation system. 16 recommendation at the end of the pilot. 15 of those were process and organizational measures. How to use costs better within the police organization, who should print the form, who he should give it to. One recommendation about CAS effectiveness. Zero thoughts about bias, prejudice, amplification, legal status, or the desirability of predictive policing. Police is all in on this shit. Like so, I personally am worried about this. And that's all I got to say. Thank you very much. <laughs>